joining us on this steamy Thursday. I think no matter where you are, it is officially steamy. Um, all the prams for Rosalio, it's just warm. Um, we are, we're excited to, to welcome you to yet another um, Canopy Strategic Partners webinar. I'm Anna Musin miller I'm the Director of Planning for Canopy, um, and I'm joined uh, this afternoon, morning, depending on where you are, by Lori Perkins. Lori, you want to say hi? Sure. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I think I know many or most of you on this call. I'm a um, vice president with Canopy. Both Anna and I just recently celebrated our one-year anniversary of officially being with Canopy. Yes, uh, it's been a heck of a year um, and a wonderful year. And yeah, I'm glad to see all of you. This is not about me, so that I'll end my intro there. So we're we're excited to um, bring some familiar and also new faces into our conversation today. Um, we're talking about breaking down silos. So thinking about um, every role within a cultural attraction um, has its own passion, its own sort of corner of the work. Um, and we also can't function without folks that are sitting in other seats. And so we're perpetually in the role of translator, um, sometimes more or less successfully. And so we wanted to bring folks who are regularly uh, breaking down silos uh, between different parts of their organization to chat with us about what has worked, maybe what has not worked um, for them. And, uh, and help us all think a little bit about how to do that with our, within our own organization and context. For folks who I haven't met before, um, my background is in um, zoo, museum, um, exhibit design and development, and uh, the project management and cat herding that goes along with that. Um, and so that idea of, uh, of having to bridge between animal folks and design folks and educators um, is, is a regular part of that work. Um, so this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I know Lori, in your role in operations and in animal care, you've also had to bridge those uh, bridge those gaps frequently. Uh, yes, uh, quite a lot. I think that the, um, the particularly the animal folks among us, uh, that's the side of the profession that I have come from. Um, uh, through most of my history, recognize that I, I don't, I'm sure it's not unique to our profession, but it sure feels like it is sometimes that, you know, the animal people exist in this silo, the educators exist in this silo, the, the admin people are over here. And it often has felt, again, through it for 30 some years that I've been in this profession, it has often felt like those teams struggle to talk to one another or struggle to maintain good communication um, among uh, those teams and we all need each other you know that's the that's always been the the hard part um, particularly as you move up into leadership roles you start to recognize oh my gosh we we, we cannot function without all of these people um, working together all these teams working together but it oddly persists you know this 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 problem tends to persist and how do we address that so we are very happy to have the three people that are going to solve it 100% for us today. Um, and we'll all be done. We can put a checkbox, right? Yes, see, Rosalia is on board. Uh, <laughs> so we have, I'll, I'll ask all of you to uh, please share more about yourselves. Just a very quick intro um, to our attendees here. We have uh, Rosalia Rubio, who is a Curator of Education for Visitor Engagement at the Los Angeles Zoo. Um, he has, I didn't know this before, and I love it. He has a history of, in, in theater and film uh, before moving into sort of more uh, formalized teaching setting. Um, and then this, the world of informal education in zoos, and you can't get much more informal um, than the education environment in, in zoos. Uh, we have Marcus Harshaw, who is a new friend for me, and I'm happy to, to meet him and know him. Uh, Senior Director of Museum Experiences at the Carnegie Science Center. And he's got a long history in education, evaluation, exhibit and experience roles in, in museums. Um, I love that Marcus described himself as a guest fanatic. And so I'm very excited to hear more about what that means today. Um, and um, my buddy, Jenny Jansen has uh, 
taken time out of her day to join us as well. She is assistant curator at the National Aquarium and a research associate at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. She's a shark girl and a jelly girl. Um, and she's also very involved. One of the things I love about Jenny is her involvement in professional organizations um, and this desire to move our profession forward. Um, and in addition to multiple other roles, she is the president and co-founder of um, Minorities in Aquarium and Zoo Science. Uh, and that organization has the mission to advance the aquarium and zoo sciences by diversifying the people and perspectives within those fields. So in addition to bringing the animal chops, she's bringing us also that sort of perspective as well today. Um, so I think we will sort of jump jump in. Yeah, Anna? Anna, sorry. Do that? Mm -hmm. Let's go for it. Uh, and yeah. Um, so maybe if we, let's start off with maybe sort of a softball question that you can use to, and please uh, share more about your background yourselves as well, but tell us what siloing looks like to you in your role from the, from the place where you sit. What does siloing look like to you and what are sort of the pain points um, of that? And maybe we'll go in reverse order that I introduced you. Uh, Jenny, you want to launch us? Yeah, I think um, for me, siloing being in an animal care position at National Aquarium, I think I think when it becomes most apparent is when, and that you that people kind of had this emotional reaction to the siloing, is when information comes about of something happening that may pertain to your department or area that it's like, how did we not know about this? You know, and it could happen between any group or for any reason or, or if it's, you know, being communicated outward. And it's like, how did we not know this operationally inside? Um, and it and it has that ability to kind of like drive a wedge of the like why and process and and all of that. So um, which unfortunately breaks down into communication. Um, so, you know, it's it's tough because one of the things that we have tried is having 15 different ways to communicate information now. So um, it's also paring those down and, you know, consuming as well as communicating and having time for all of that. So. Marcus, I saw a lot of nodding happening. Uh, I I love, I love where Jenny went with this. Like um, I, we have a saying, at least we don't, I do. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. It's all <laughs> Um, here at Carnegie Science Center, that I, it's called NETMA. No one ever tells me anything. And I'll note, I always note that siloing is at its most rampant when I hear that specific phrase. No one ever tells me anything. It's like, ha ha, this is how we know that something has gained enough steam, gained enough traction, gained enough attention to understand that Yep, this is a thing that's happening that somehow we missed. And it's and it happens probably more often than I think we'd all like to admit. Um, but that's kind of, you know, how I how I feel about that. Um yeah. What are the different uh roles within Carnegie Science Center that you're in contact with? Because I know you have both the Science Center that you're trying to cross those, cross those divides within as well as the whole Carnegie system, which is multiple sites. Oh yeah, yeah. So for those of you lesser familiar, Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh is the four uh, Carnegie Museums, natural history, art, Andy Warhol and us here, the Science Center. Um, and we're spread over uh, three different physical campus locations across Pittsburgh. And so not only do we have our own siloing challenges within each of our uh, of the four museums, but we have this other siloing sort of component on top of that with some of our our central services and you know those services like HR and IT that really serve all four museums and each other, and that some of that siloing that occurs between the four museums themselves. Um, so, you know, it's not unheard of that our natural history wants to do a, a program and it very tangentially related to some science content that we're, that we're doing here at the Science Center. And so not only do we have these, no one ever tells me anything from across the hall, but I have them from across town. 
That's great. Thank you for that context. I think that helps illustrate uh, the, the full breadth of silos. <laughs> Uh, and Rosalia, how about yeah, you? Yeah, we know no one ever tells educators anything. I have I have led enough education departments to know that that's true. You you don't hear anything, right? I was just about to say, you know, sometimes you know we we're we're supposed to disseminate this information out on grounds, and then we're like sometimes the last ones to really hear about what's going on. You know, um, it's uh, the 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 process of getting information is usually like you start hearing rumors about something here or this animal. And I know there's, we have a lot of sensitive information that, you know, shouldn't be kind of disseminated. And so we we kind of, uh, we do have to measure ourselves as to what we can, you know, relay to the public and what can't be, but um, just getting it to us so that we can kind of figure out what to tell our specialists to go out and be able to tell the public sometimes is, is challenging, you know, because, um, I know I may be jumping again a little bit, but um, the this issue of us um, being able to break down those silos, we built relationships with so many, you know, with animal care, with construction that sometimes somebody will hear something, will hear a rumor, you know, or somebody will tell somebody and then it'll take a little while to make sure it's verified before we start, you know, examining, oh, I heard from this keeper this, or I heard from construction that this is happening and I heard from you know, admin that this is time. Wait a minute. We have to make sure that um, we're getting all the correct information so that we can go off and, and kind of share it with the public. But so yeah, it's it is a lot of the communication sometimes that gets siloed, and who needs to know what is is always a, a challenge. Well, and I imagine Rosalio, in your role, because you have the the visitor engagement piece in your title, so that's your you're that nexus, you and your team. Um, and one uh, sort of speaking from the the sort of admin side in my history, it it's always that challenge of I want to keep the team informed. I want to let mm -hmm. I don't want you to read about it first in the in the paper or on online somewhere. I want you to know, but how do I ensure with I don't know how many people work at the Los Angeles yes. so my, my little zoos that I worked at with you know two hundred people. How do I keep the, the wall up, you know, so that we're not, I'm keep, keeping you informed, but not letting the information go farther. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that encourages silos, right? Is that let's, let's embargo this information, not because I don't want the educator to know, but because I don't want the world to know, you know? So it's like, how do, how do you, how do you build those kind of relationships that, that it can create that kind of trust, especially Given the num the turnover that we have in our organizations as well, I think I think it is a little bit of of building that trust with administration, with again, with the relationships that you build across the silos, across departments. That that you know, we're we're in a position to say, you know, we're not disseminating information that does, that shouldn't be. Like we need to we need to be trusted in that sense that. Um, you know, we're not going to let rumors abound or, or you know, until there's a, a press release, like we can know we can prepare for things so that when the information does come out and there is a press release for, you know, any event that has gone on, we're prepared and we're not scrambling at the last minute. Oh, we we just heard about it like everybody else just did. And now we have to, you know, um, uh, prepare ourselves and, and adjust to to be able to let the people know and then be able to answer questions about it, because that's that's ultimately what we're the first ones that will get the, the questions from from guests about if, if something you know major has happened. So we need to be prepared as well. I I'd like to sort of add on to, to to what he just said there that like sometimes in what I've realized in my experience and mostly as I've moved from like 17 years ago, I started as a part time presenter on the museum floor. Right. And I thought I had I was supposed to know everything because I was in that frontline role. Guests are asking me all the time, all these questions I wasn't prepared to answer. And what I realized that the more I took on higher responsibility and more roles is that there were points in time when it wasn't my turn to know the thing yet. And it's been interesting as I'm trying to balance not siloing information but at the same time, not, you know, 
not giving all the information away. And then I see it on Instagram and it's like, oh, no, 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 this was not ready, not prepared for public consumption. Um, and how I've tried to, mostly in my role here, is really try to um, manage expectations of all departments on you'll know the thing when it's your time, when it's your turn to know the thing, when it's baked enough that, okay, now you need to know all this level of the detail or, okay, now it's perfect for public consumption and be able to sort of manage between, uh, between that also. I, I like the, that the way you put that just there, Marcus, about the, it's not perfect for public consumption. And I think that speaks to what Jess just put in the, in the chat that I think is, really, really important. This is, you know, it's our profession has this fear of, of telling the stories, you know. Um, uh, Jenny, I know you've, I see you nodding and I know you've had some experience with this. What can you share about that? I was actually going to jump in on the part about like with operational groups and trying to build that trust because yeah. I know like in trying to, you know, in working with your own team of people and sometimes you have that information but it is not meant to be shared yet and a lot of it is trying to convey the the information is known but I can't share it yet so that at least the team knows that key players do have information not just that everybody's flying blind <laughs> it's a very different feeling but saying there is information it is known it is being laid out strategically so that they have an idea that, okay, they are being thoughtful about it. When I am able to share it, then we will share it. And, you know, so that they can see that there's a plan and then it's happening. And um, I was just going to kind of bring up one of the things that I feel like trips people up and organizations up a lot is that BCC button on emails where it's like, I just got this email explaining all these things, but I have no idea who got it. So who else knows it? Does it have instructions to cascade it? Does it have instructions not to? And if it did or it did not, then why can't we see who is receiving this email? Like, why is it a secret? So therefore there must be some kind of aspect to this that is secretive. And it just becomes very confusing. And it's like, I don't know. I mean, I get the reason for having it, but if one is able to only use the BCC for very specific things instead of announcements, that would be very helpful for people. And just saying, this can be shared or please do not. And you can see all the people who have access to it, make note. Um, and I think that's just kind of an operational tool that can be helpful to all of us. Um, but as far as, you know, trying to have, you know, bringing out those messages that sometimes we were very scared of saying, I think we have gotten to a better place in the world with social media and being more transparent and being, um, having, you know, trying to develop that trust with individuals in the general public, as far as we aren't perfect. You know, we are all doing our best and doing our best is all about continuing to do better and being open about that. And I think, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of history of of the like, let's don't talk about it. Um, there's also, you know, time that it takes to be strategic about making sure that the appropriate parties know in-house before it goes out. And sometimes that takes time. Um, so, you know, I think it is it is one of those things. It's not just important to know who needs to know information does exist, but it's there is that in turn. Um, and then and I was and I was kind of curious also, like, depending on the type of messaging, like kind of like what you were talking about, Rosalio, is what like how much are the marketing teams involved in that? In crafting those messages. I, I I was just making a note. I love this. Um, I love what's happening in the chat as well as what you were just saying, Jenny, because it's about you build trust through transparency, right? That's one of the most important tools for building trust and recognizing that some of our 
information in our organization, organizations isn't ready for prime time, we, right? But if we can be transparent to the level of, I, I have stuff I can't tell you, but trust me, I have stuff and I'm, and I'm doing it. Don't, don't worry that I'm dropping the ball or that like you're saying, use the, either use BCC or not use BCC, but, but use it in a way where you're saying, here's who else knows this. Cause you're absolutely right. When I get something where I'm BCC done, that's exactly what I want. Well, who else knows about this? Was this, were they sending me this as something as a negative? you know, hey, look at this horrible thing that's happening, or are they sending me this to Sharon and who else knows about it? So I do, I love the idea of saying, here's who knows this, here's where it's gone, here's why, here's the next step. It just sort of that clarity of communication. And again, from a leadership point of view, you don't have to reveal everything. If you're not, if it's not ready for prime time, you don't have to reveal everything. Um, one of the things, thinking of external communications that um, stood us in very good stead at Zoo Atlanta. Um, we had a very large um, population of gorillas that was getting real old. And it was like, they're all going to die. And maybe like right in a row. So every single time, if we're talking about a sloth birth, we also say at the bottom, we have the largest collection of, of gorillas in, in the world and they're old and they're going to, I mean, we sort of socialize that message with our public all the time. And it's just that transparency. I always, it, it, troubles me when I see zoos that are afraid to talk about deaths or, or you know, problems. Um, it's about the socialization of it. I'm going off on a, on a tangent. Anna, Anna, stop me. <laughs> well, I think the, the uh, path that we were starting to tread uh, specifically on BCC kind of opens up a, uh, a question that I have more generally just about um, adopting a uh, or accommodating one's approach to this based on um, your own role, but also the personalities in play, um, that level of transparency around who has received this and what am I supposed to do with it or not um, is, a, is a very practical, approachable tool. I'm curious if people have experiences adapting their approach similarly to that, where it's like, here's the thing that I did that worked <laughs> um, that, that folks could take away to use in their own context. I mean, I think, I think somewhat related to that, but also on the animal death topic is that I think it changes over time. Um, some of it changes with the general public some of it changes with a particular institution's communication um, strategies or the, the trust that they've been building with the general public. It depends on the, the, the opinions of leadership. It depends on the opinions of you know, the curatorial team. It, and it takes all of those groups coming together, which I feel like should probably touch base on that like every few years because I've certainly had conversations, you know, with, um, you know, there could be like the head of marketing versus our video productions team versus one curator in a particular area versus a curator over a different group of taxa versus what does the leadership team think um, versus, you know, what is the comfort level of the, of the educators who are engaging with the public on a daily basis. All of those are different areas of, you know, potential siloing where people could have different feelings of it, but how does that play into, how does an organization choose and agree upon what the organization is comfortable communicating? And sometimes it's, you know, particular curators are comfortable to a certain level, including, you know, the veterinary team, you know, what is the level that they're comfortable with? What is the level that video productions is comfortable with? What is the level that social media is, you know, comfortable? And it, I think it really does require getting everybody into a room and saying, where are the individuals at? Because each individual as a, you know, a person of, in of their own personal integrity kind of needs to be tied into that. Um, cause some people are like, yeah, totally open. And others are like, yeah, no, that totally freaks me out. Um, and that kind of stuff needs to be heard. And I think it, it, it does shape how the organization moves forward because even if one is totally fine putting it out, if the person that's providing that information isn't comfortable, you're not going to get it. 
yeah, there's so much of this that is tied up with individual priorities and personalities that having that having that sort of regular check-in to establish transparency around not only external communication, but also internal communication. Where's our comfort level? Who needs to know what, when? Um, which also ties back into what you were talking about, Jenny, with the timeline necessary. Like just having that explicit conversation about what the what is the cascade? What is the expected timeline for the cascade can, can help leadership and team members all feel like they know they know what and when they're gonna get um, and when that's supposed to go from internal to external information. I'm seeing some nods. <laughs> uh, there's good stuff happening in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading uh, Jess's message. Um, and uh, Everyone in the meeting, please feel free to to speak up and share your thoughts as well. The chat was we're saving the chat and it's good stuff. Um, um, but feel free to uh, raise your hand or or pop in or something. Um, I do agree very strongly with what Jess has said about telling our stories transparently to the public. Our our we all know our public is much more uh, sophisticated and aware and and questioning. Now, you know, sort of holding us to a to a standard, and I think that the way we meet that, and and continue to retain their respect and their esteem, um, and their trust, is by telling them the truth about what we are doing in our in our collections, whether they're physical collections or I mean, you know living collections or um, or non living collections. I think it's important to build that kind of trust um, with our teams. Um, one of the questions that I had for the panelists um, uh, and for everyone is sort of it, I, one of the ways that is helpful, at least for me to learn things is when I see things that went wrong, because I make a lot of the mistakes and um, I always say I'll make better mistakes tomorrow. Um, but what are what are some of the ways that that this has not worked for you? Have you had experiences where you have I don't know, tried to bridge divides and things went kind of wonky on you or strategies that you thought would work didn't work. Do you have any experiences with that sort of thing? Rosalio? Yeah, um, I think um, I've, I've been here at the zoo uh, for 17 years now. Um, Part-time about 10 years and full-time now about seven. Um, so I've gotten to know a lot of different people all across you know the, the campus um and I, I think a lot of times when when you do come up with um a little bit of difficulties when there's personality clashes like when someone has an i want to say like an old school way of thinking that they're they're kind of stuck in 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 a, a certain narrative and a certain perspective that they feel like they they enjoyed the silo i want to say and so they like they didn't want to work with education they don't i don't like those people in education i don't like those people over there you know in admin you know just let me do my job it's like well we gotta work together we like there's some things that we need to 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 come together on because you know we want to tell your story but if if you're not allowing us to do it then how are we how are we going to move forward you know so i think a lot of it is is, is a clash in personalities and, and again, in, in, in an old school way of thinking, which I know has has changed a lot in the 17 years that I've been here. So um, it's gone a, a lot better. And again, I think the the efforts to really break down those silos and, and bridge those those gaps between departments has really helped in in being able to better communicate with each other and being able to at least work with each other and, and be be kind of a little bit more of a unified campus. You know, I think you're, you know, you make a good point. Silos can be a comfortable place to live, especially when you've lived in it for a long time. It's like, this is, this is my jam. This is how I do my thing. And mm -hmm. I'm just tootling along doing this. And it can be uncomfortable um, and just harder to have to work with other personalities and authorities and try to figure out how to fit my world and my priorities in with somebody else's priorities um, and make that work as a team. So I think that's a really important point. Um, other thoughts, uh, Jenny or Marcus or or anyone? Yeah, I, I think 
um, I mean, communication is a, is a big part of that, but I think some of the challenges that I've seen here are trying to break down silos more across the four museums of Carnegie is more on sort of it being more introspective and understanding that those things to actually take a whole lot of time when you have an organization. Um, Carnegie's museums have been around for 127 years this year. So there's a lot of institutional history. There's a lot of institutional baggage. There's a lot of that kind of like people and people that have been here for 30 and 40 years. And so understanding and being honest with myself about, even though I am a ray of sunshine and a personality that is just billowing with, you know, happiness and excitement, it still takes, be honest about how long it's going to take to break down silos and just break people's will and spirit to want to continue to stay siloed. It's okay, Lori, you can laugh at that one. That one's good. I like the idea that what we're going to do is break their will and spirit. I, I Yeah, okay. That sounds like it. <laughs> There's a takeaway for you. There's a takeaway for you. Yeah, silos, boo. I mean, I would add to that, that, you know, the baggage is not just institutional, but is personal to each individual. You know, if someone has gotten burnt in their history, no matter where they were, you know, they're going to have feelings about that. And um, it, it, yeah, it's like you get a team that works really well together and it's like, let's keep this team rolling. And then it's like bringing in, you know, outside influences. It, yeah, it's going to trip it up. It's going to make it a little bit, you know, more clunky. Um, but in some cases that, you know, it's like, but that needs to happen. Um, I think, you know, for me, a lot of the, you know, working with people across different departments is really trying to, you know, it's like, and we say it all the time about like, well, we all have the same, you know, goal in mind, you know, we all, we all want the best things. And it's like, yeah, we do. But if you like, you have to like, you have to like sit in that and like really believe it sometimes to be able to sit and talk with somebody about, okay, well, but we have to find a way, like if we all agree, and it's like having these larger kind of community agreements about, yes, we all want the best things. And here is why I have concerns because I have seen information used this way, or I have seen this happen, or we tried this at some point in time. So it's like, so we can inform each other on what is the history based on? So if we are going to move forward together, that we make sure that we know how to step around those things that have happened in the past. And they don't just live in one person's brain and experience. Um, so which is, again, foundational to communication. Um, yeah. And I think there's also an assumption that we're all speaking the same language. Like if we've gone through the process of identifying our mission statement and we can all you know, we've all got it tattooed on the back of our eyelids and we can can uh, rattle it off. That doesn't necessarily mean that it means the same thing to me in my role as it means to you in your role. And so uh, being able to have that dialogue where we are uh, intentionally articulating, what is it that I am trying to get out of this communication, whether it's external or internal, um, can help to sort of reinforce yeah, in fact, we are all on the same train going the same direction. It's just that, you know, my I'm in a different car than you are. Um, I want to bring up a, a um, point and question that Misha had um, in the chat, because we've been talking a lot about um, kind of sensitive topics. Um, Misha is bringing up this, uh, this idea that there's also some um, so jealousy between departments that sometimes becomes part of a siloing problem. Who gets to go to conferences? Um, who gets to participate in sort of extra extracurricular um, activities like doing field conservation? Um, get highlighted by leadership, that sort of thing. So, is there? Um, do folks have examples that have helped bridge those uh, those divides when it's not just about um, this is this is information that we have to carefully shepherd, but I feel like my department is not getting the same 
kind of treatment or experiences that other departments have. I mean, in the animal care field, I mean, we get to do things that are like really super cool sometimes. And like, we've invited our plumbers and electricians to come out shark fishing with us. You know, we don't, we can't open that up to a ton of people because only so many people can fit on the boat and we can only go out so often or any, you know, a certain number of days a year. But it's like, if we do, we try to see it's like, hey, from your team, is there, you know, one or two people from, you know, from the facilities group that would like to join us on the boat? Get out of the building, be in the sun, hang out with us, eat lunch, you know, sing sea shanties, you know, all those things. <laughs> Marcus is a in. great, I am a great sea shanty shantier. <laughs> I can sing them with the best of them. That would be with with my boss. He is legendary. You can get out on the boat and compare scars like that scene in Jaws, you know, or oh, I got this one from the, you know. Um, I think that's, you know, it's so funny. Like all, I saw a lot of nodding and a lot of enthusiasm about that. And it's so funny that it's like, why is that such a big idea? It should be be so ordinary but it but it isn't but I think it is kind of an easy thing you we ask all of these people from the non-animal care you know the animal care people get to do the cool stuff I think animal care and education these are the sort of the mission people that get to do the cool stuff why not invite the the operations or the the maintenance team uh, to participate in that they work at a zoo after all <laughs> you know I, I love that uh, Rosalia were you gonna say something Yes. Um, so one of the things um, that Jenny was talking about, you know, animal keepers get to do a lot of great things. And uh, there was a just a, a personal kind of anecdote. Uh, there was a, a grant that, that we had at the zoo um, that was historically uh, for keepers to do uh, field field research and field conservation, you know, outside of of the continent of the United States. And so for a long time, it was keepers only until uh, a few years ago, it opened up to basically they said everyone, anyone can apply for it, it, it as long as you your skill set can help uh, some outside conservation organization. And so we we applied. Uh, people in education applied, and and I was lucky enough to 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 be the recipient of one. Um, and I heard murmurings like, wait, why? This is a keeper thing. Why is it here? Or why why is it opening up to others? Like you know that kind of thing where. It, it, the, the the perks of certain departments were kind of being shared with everyone that's like, wait a minute, that's that's mine. Like you can't use that. <laughs> like the same thing with like like budgeting, like all the budget when it, they when the budgets come, it's like, well, why are you getting more than than we are? And what that's for that. So it it kind of adds to that that siloing as well. Like sometimes you there are some that feel that, well, this is for us and you know, now it's opening up and other people are getting in and then that's taking away from me being able to get in. So, I also, also the mind is, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to make an observation that I also think it's kind of funny because there, there are definitely times where it is, you know, we want, we want more of this. We want more of this. And then when it's offered, it's like, yeah, I don't want to do that. I mean, because that does exist from time to time, but... <laughs> I see Lachlan's put a hand up. I, I did, you guys reminded me of something that I had actually forgotten. And back in 2017 or 18, we had a change in leadership and um, after 40 years, right? So everything changed and everyone had been very, very siloed. And we were making all these efforts to undo that again, 40 years later. But one of the things we first did was we, there's a new uniform item and everyone got a shirt in every department. And the idea was that, um, you know, conservation and animal care and our mission doesn't live in the animal division. That was the impetus behind this. And that, um, so everyone got a shirt that said they were a keeper of something, right? So maybe you're an animal keeper, but maybe you're a gatekeeper. That was our admission staff. Maybe you're a bookkeeper, you're our finance. And everyone had their keeper of what? Um, I can't remember them all, but right. all. 18 to 20 divisions had something keeper 
and we thought it was brilliant. And oh boy, the animal care team was not impressed because we didn't bring those stakeholders on board with like, hey, here's the deal. Some of these people feel like they aren't part of the thing that matters in a way we matter. So we want to do this. But not only did we miss the mark, but we didn't engage them in that dialogue before. So it's like really well intentioned, but as often happens, our intention and our impact were uh, misaligned. Just the, like, so that's the thing. It, it, I think that is a brilliant idea. I love that idea. I think that so many of the teams that I've managed would have loved to have felt, yeah, I'm a keeper too, but it's part of the earlier part of this conversation. You weren't transparent in the development of the idea, you know, so it's a great lesson. I, I still think that's something that could work really well at a lot of institutions if it's developed in, in the right way. I, I love it. Anything that emphasizes the, the, the fact that we all cannot exist without one another in our organizations and that all of those roles um, play a part in the, in the mission and the vision. Um, it's one of the things that um, those of you that we've worked with in strategic planning know that we, we emphasize that a lot about how the, the actions that the custodial staff is doing today tears up to the mission and vision. There is a direct line in, in trying to demonstrate that. Um, in our last 15 minutes, I still, we have a couple more questions for the panelists, but I wanna make sure we give our participants an opportunity to ask any questions or, or share any comments. So please either raise your hand like, like Lachlan did or, or make a noise <laughs> so we know you want to, to speak. Um, uh, there's an interesting example that Jess shared and Ali seconded in the chat of um, an internal paid internship program um, where people within the organization have the opportunity to learn about other roles um, as, as, as part of their paid time. And I think that that, along with some of what we were talking about earlier in terms of the ability to participate in um, field work um, or the um, just just the resources needed for creating time to communicate in an intentional way, like all of these have resource implications, um, whether it's time or funds. Um, I'm curious from the panelists if you've seen a particular um, a particular resource need uh, in in some of the examples that you've seen successful. Um, and Jess is raising a hand, so I'm going to let her, because that was her, her suggestion there in the chat. Um, I just wanted to, to clarify. So our paid internship program is actually external. Um, so we have interns that come in. It's specifically targeted to members of systemically excluded communities, BIPOC, LGBTQIA, or varying abilities. Um, and it's designed as an intro to zoo and conservation fields. And so what we um, try and do with that is expose the interns all across the board to all the various types of professions that exist at the zoo. Um, and then uh, that's one of the target outcomes, but another one is um, to more equitably provide professional development opportunities to teams across the zoo. And so this is a component of that. And we had the same ask last year. This is our second year, third year. I don't know. Anyway, second. Thank you, Rosalio. Um, so we had the same ask last year and we got very few who, you know, kind of opted in because it was like this weird thing that, you know, the learning and engagement, the equity programs team, they were doing like our weird stuff that we typically do. But this year, uh, like I put it in there, we, I sent out the ask and literally every single person like very enthusiastically said, okay, yes, we want to do this. And it was amazing how they were learning from each other about the roles that they are doing. But then they also got the, the support and, and positive recognition from the interns. Um, and that was, I think, really validating for, you know, the staff who typically may not be recognized in the way that our keepers or other frontline staff are. I just add on to that. I, uh, you know, being part of that that um, that intern program has really opened my eyes to to how 
willing um, a lot of people are to share of their time um, and and be willing to break down those silos. I mean, uh, as I was looking across the, the the two panels that we had, I was like, wow, I like I personally know like many of these, and so they're like many of the panelists. So it's it's great to see that that they're willing to kind of go across you know, the, the their own departments. And then not only that, just open themselves up so much to the interns to be able to to share with them as much as they could. And and I think, I'm, I'm hoping that this, this is not just isolated, it's not just siloed here at, at, the, uh, at the zoo, but it could be across, um, you know, all of the institutions where people are more open to, uh, to get communications from, everyone everywhere to, to be able to ask questions and answer questions for people across. So it, it was it was very inspiring. Um, technically, I think, uh, sorry, I think it is three. We had the two on the first year for the paid internship. So anyways, <laughs> sorry, it, it's two like full years in one like beginning pilot program. I, I think it is a, it, there's a point that uh, I think Ali made in the, in the chat. Um, it feels, you know, we all, we all feel so busy. And so I can't add something new. I can't, I don't have time for these things. But at the end of the day, I, and what we're hearing here, I think we kind of do like sharing our stuff. You know, we kind of do like it. It's, I think, a matter of finding a way that it doesn't become a brand new task. It's not a whole new, you know, I think, I think it was Jenny who said at the very top of this, um, of this session that, um, you know, when we try to solve the communication problems, what we end up doing is creating 5 billion. Now I've got, now I have to look at the Slack channel. I have to look at the email. There's the daily activity sheet that comes out and then they're going to announce it on the radio. So everybody else can, it, it's like, we, I think we tend to react very, so sort of very quickly. And, oh, you didn't hear that? Let's make a way for you to hear it. Let's do, you know, and I think if we could be more thoughtful about it, we can recognize that it doesn't necessarily take it doesn't have to take more time to be transparent and to be open if we are doing it in the right way. Um, and as and then sort of going back to my original or some sharing someone else's original point that people actually kind of dig sharing what's going on in their departments, even when it's not animal care or or artifact maintenance or something. You know, the the the, the accountants like what they're doing too. You know, and. Um, I think that that presents an opportunity for us. Um, I wonder if maybe we can try to use our last nine minutes here. I don't want to uh, keep people too long. Um, what are some examples of successes? What can we leave our, our guests with for things they might try? Um, Michael from St. Louis has a- has Yeah, a so um, let me turn my camera on, sorry. There we go. Um, so I have a unique position that was created, I think about, I don't know, eight, eight years ago. Um, and what I'm tasked to do, and there's three other people that have my same role, is that I work for education, but I'm also embedded in animal division in particular areas. So I work with the herpeterium and insectarium staff. And our role was to work with the zoological managers and curators and keepers to make sure that all the conservation work that they do and, and everything they do goes backwards to education and shared out in some way. And so there's a nice direct connection because um, we had some siloing between like a lot of institutions between animal division and education. Um, but that's been fairly successful. Um, it works pretty well to have a person in between. And it's an interesting role because if I do my job well, nobody knows what I do. It's like, what does that person do? Um, but I spend enough time um, working on both sides. So I'm, I'm also the education consultant for the herpetarium and insectarium departments. So I work on all different types of projects. Um, but that setup um, has been fairly successful. The One of the issues is obviously you know, I don't make any money. Um, I create and pilot all type, types of different projects and stuff like that. But I have a position for education that in an essence doesn't make any money. I don't typically teach a lot of programs. Um, and so besides that, it's been very successful. Um, but one cautionary tale is it was very successful working in between animal division education. But one of the issues we ran into is on the other side, we didn't realize that there was some siloing in education, even though I work there, you know, because it's all around you. And so we learned really quickly, well, I need to also now spend a lot more time on education because all the little divisions 
um, and make sure stuff is working on that side. So it's been interesting because I don't belong really to the education department anymore and I don't belong to animal division. Um, almost become like a separate part of education, kind of an in-between. So that's been an interesting role. That's great. That's an interesting construction of like having an actual person that is the bridge. Um, I'm curious from our from our panelists, anything that you have that you wanted to share about successful tactics? Um, I think, I mean, I guess it could be considered a tactic. You know, we talk about departmental siloing, but what I what I found that works that has been successful is really relationship building between individuals because all the departments are made up of individuals. And if you, it is a, it is a more time consuming process, but when you can have individuals that can communicate together and build individual trust, then when you have those departments talking, there is investment because there's an understanding between some of the players where it's like, okay, I know this person and whether it's a communication style or a particular topic, you know, it's the siloing has to deal with the individuals. It's like, yes, it's a department, but the department is made of all the individuals and how we are choosing to operate. You know, some of that is very much leadership driven within each of those groups, because it is also about how does each of the leaders of those groups, how are they willing to say, we are going to choose to be open to this group, or we are going to choose to keep things really tight to the vest. Um, and I think that has a huge influence on how the individuals within their teams then operate. And a lot of that, you know, does come from, you know, past histories and, you know, having seen bad things happen or um, just worry whether or not things have happened or not, but just worry. Um, but I think if if we can, if there is time and opportunity or creating opportunities to build those relationships, that has been, has reaped so many benefits because it's like, oh, you know what, let me call that person. I know I can get, you know, like a legit answer, whether or not I can share that information, you know, it's still, if I can hear it from a person that I trust, then I can inform how I'm communicating to the rest of my team or how we are going to then, well, if you can, you know, if we can work together to do this, then we can kind of create a strategy to make it so that the teams are, you know, in essence, working together. Ali, uh, Ali suggests food. In yeah, the chat. It's, it's a no fail. Yeah. It, it, you can't, you can't go wrong with food. Um, yeah, I was I was just going to say here here at the at LSU we've created um, kind of what what's called the culture club and every we all sing um, I'm a chameleon before no, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, so the culture club uh, uh, creates these these events where all staff are invited like whether it's a you know breakfast you know coffee and and a and a breakfast burrito everybody can meet and kind of mingle uh, once a month or maybe once every other month. Um, but that just gets everybody kind of mingling and talking. And and I think one of the things what I mentioned in the chat, like everyone loves a little appreciation, like an acknowledgement, like that's that's all that really takes that that little spark can can kind of grow with just an acknowledgement of, hey, how's it going? Good morning, you know, whether it's somebody you know, wherever they're doing and um uh, compliments go go a long way, you know. It's just it's just taking the the time and the effort to to really try and and put yourself out there and, and like, like we were saying there are some personalities that are going to be grumpy in the morning they haven't had their coffee that's okay you know we, we just you just keep at it you just keep going and um i think like marcus was saying you know we're all kind of big balls of sunshine everywhere so let's let's all go out and and and, and brighten somebody's day that that it, it really goes a long way creating a culture where that's normal and it's not forced you know, um, we had a period of time at Zoo Atlanta when we were the weekend duty officer, where um, under a previous leadership, we were required to, you had to give out like three different recognition cards. And they, so by the end of the day, I'm like, oh, 
geez, let me go find three people and make some, you know, and it's like, that's not, this is kind of not the spirit of it, but because it was a forced thing, you know, it, it didn't really become part of the culture and it wasn't real and meaningful. And I think that's the thing. It has to be legit and, and real, but we have to learn, I think that it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be that, you know, you saved the person from the escape tiger and now you get, resi- you know, it has to be, no, that was really cool of you to buy that kid an ice cream cone when he dropped his ice cream cone. Uh, nice thing, you know, whatever. Anyway, I'll, sh- I'll shut up and let, let Anna wrap us and, Marcus, did you have any yeah, as our ball of sunshine? No, all right, okay. Um, so what I what I was hearing throughout that conversation was uh, the thread of intentionality. Like we have uh, throughout this talked about the need for transparency, uh, the need for formal and informal development of relationships, the cultivation of connection between um, individuals and between departments, it, just inviting participation um, as being a means of relationship building, but also providing recognition of the work that folks are already doing. So it's not adding a burden, but all of that is, is wrapped up with this, this idea of, of being intentional, of saying, um, we know that our departments are not communicating. We know that there is a siloing issue. Um, Like Jenny was saying, let's get everybody in a room, um, establish, uh, reaffirm that we have a shared mission, a shared set of of values and intentions for this organization that we're all trying to deliver on and, and get in dialogue with each other again about what that looks like for everybody in their own contexts, with their own histories, within the organizational history. But just starting, I think, sounds like the, like picking a little thing and starting um, sounds like a strong takeaway. I don't know, Lori, if you heard anything in addition. No, I think you did a great job of wrapping up. I think those are the, the primary points. I am loving what Jenny is putting in the chat. And I think that's something that helps those of us who fall towards the end of the introvert scale that... We sit with the same people and you see it every time you have a a zoo gathering, they sit with the same people. That's okay. But if you're somebody who's a bridge, do do an intro. And I love the idea, hey, this person is cool because they did this and this, you know, and I just, I love that because you're helping us find a way to connect across areas. Um, Those of you who are more socially uh, (laughs) brave um, than some, I love it. Yeah, yeah, high school lunchroom. (laughs) <laughs> still makes me kind of eh, I gotta go sit in the corner some trauma there Lori yeah, um, so that's our that's our not to sound like a therapist but that's our time um, it's been uh, it's been great to see everybody uh, on this call and I think the the beginnings of connections have happened here uh, in this conversation and in, in the chat so um, Lauren uh, I know that we're gonna post this recording so folks can can share with other members of their team um, any sort of housekeeping um, here at the end of the call? Um, no, we'll be sending that out um, as we normally do. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for making time um, to, to talk about this. We could go for hours because uh, there's it's a rich topic, but we were happy to spend this little time. And thank you to Jenny, Rosalio, and to Marcus for, for sharing your perspectives with us.